Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're so glad you've joined us today. My name is Gary Parker. I'm the Associate Dean for External Affairs at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis, where I also have the great priv privilege of being the director of the Clark Fox Policy Institute and serving on the board of directors of Ford through Ferguson. And welcome to part eight of our COVID and race series, High Price of Economic Justice. Now, before we begin today's uh, panel, I just want to give you a, 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 a upcoming notice about one we have on Thursday. It's called Systemic Racism and Mental Health, and we're doing it in collaboration with the Association, uh, the Academy of Social Work, uh, uh, Schools and Social Welfare, and it is going to be a really, so sorry, that's the doorbell ringing. We are, this is what happens when you Zoom. Uh, we, we are expecting a very wonderful discussion on systemic racism and mental health. It'll be featuring Sean Joe, who is a professor right here at the Brown School at Washington University, Professor David Takushi, who is a professor at the University of Washington, and it'll be moderated by Laura Abrams, who's a professor of social welfare and the director of the social work program at UCLA uh, Luskin School of Public Affairs. Uh, we have already almost 600 RSVPs for that event, and I hope that you'll be able to join us. That'll be on Thursday, August 6th from 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, you can register for that where you registered for this at the Open Classroom site. I will put the link in the uh, comment section so that you can participate. I want to thank our sponsors and partners for today's program, Ford through Ferguson, the, uh, the Prevention Research Center at WashU, the Social Policy Institute, and Better Family Life. We're really grateful uh, for your partnership and your uh, collaboration. So although you, we cannot see or hear you, your, your microphones and cameras have been disabled, we want you to be a part of today's conversation. So please use the chat feature to send us your thoughts, your questions. We also find that folks love to put links for resources as the conversation is ongoing, and we hope that you'll consider doing that as well. It's been a really kind of lively conversation and a back and forth. As you uh, send in your questions, my amazing co-host uh, will and I will um, We'll moderate those and, and give them to our panelists. And speaking of amazing co-hosts, I want to first thank Janet Gillow, who's the Director of, uh, of Professional Development at the Brown School and our partnership with the Open Classroom. She's been doing an amazing job. I want to thank uh, Cynthia Williams, our Assistant Dean for Community Partnerships, who's been a, an amazing thought partner and producer of this event and moderator in, in, on many of them. And of course, a big, huge thank you uh, to my collaborator, my associate director for the Clark Fox Policy Institute, and most importantly, my friend, please give a warm welcome to Atia Thurman. Hello, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Gary, for being uh, one of the thought partners, the executive producer for the series. It's been quite a journey and such a great experience, and I can't believe we're already at number eight. And I thank all the people who've been on the journey with us. If this is your first time, welcome to the first in the series. And if it's not, we're really grateful that you keep coming back for this conversation. In the United States, the COVID-19 economic crisis has resulted in nearly 15 million job losses. Research from the Economic Policy Institute reveals that those getting hit hardest are women and people of color. Other sources forecast that Black and Hispanic individuals and families will face particularly large increases in poverty rates as a result of the pandemic's economic effects. We are facing one of the most prevailing economic crises of our time, worse than the previous recession and comparable to the Great Depression. Considering who's able to weather this and who will suffer most, the stark reality is that we cannot afford to ignore the material consequences of racism, white supremacy, a systemic exclusion of black and brown people from building wealth and historical structural racism that has given rise to an egregious wealth gap. This, for example, the net worth of the typical white family is nearly 10 times greater than that of a black family. Joining me today are some incredible researchers, data and policy analysts, and community builders. And they're here to discuss with us the current financial landscape and to share some ideas for how do we turn the tide against economic injustice and advance racial equity. At this time, I would like each of them to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about who you are, uh, your role in the region, and what you're working on right now. 
And I'm going to start with Tyrone because he already has his, he's already unmuted. <laughs> All righty. Uh, good after, yes, afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tyrone Turner. Uh, I am the Vice President of Housing and Community Outreach for a Better Family Life here in St. Louis, Missouri. I've been with the organization about 12, going on 13 years. Uh, I have a, a degree in finance, uh, local, locally grown uh, native. Uh, went to Metro High School for those that know Metro High School. Um, did, I, did I just blink off? Am I good? I'm good? Okay. All righty. So I uh, went to Metro High School. Um, and uh, went to Southeast Missouri State. That's where I got my degree in finance. Came back home uh, and started doing some, some local community work on my own. Ended up uh, falling here at Better Family Life or landing at Better Family Life. And I've been here ever since. And so um, the work we do at Better Family Life encompasses uh, a few different pillars. Uh, we work in housing, of course. Uh, we do intensive door-to-door uh, -door in the community in some of the, the tougher uh, more challenged neighborhoods uh, in and around the St. Louis uh, metropolitan area. Uh, with community outreach, we, we also work in youth, family, and clinical services. Uh, we have a, a workforce program and we work in cultural arts. And so those combined uh, are our approach to helping rebuild families from, from the ground up. Thank you so much, Tyrone. If we could move over to Karishma Furtado. Hi everyone, my name is Karishma Furtado. I'm the Data and Research Catalyst at Forward Through Ferguson, which has been mentioned a couple of times now. It's the continuation of the Ferguson Commission, which was of course impaneled after the death, the killing of Michael Brown Jr. Uh, and our focus, our charge at Forward Through Ferguson is catalyzing the implementation of the 189 calls to action that the commission released as it sunsetted. Um, I'm also the co-lead on the Still Compromising series that we'll get to talk a little bit about. And I'm leading a, a major project on the structural inequities built into our educational system. I just wrapped up my PhD in, in public health sciences where I studied the discipline gap or the disproportionate rate at which black students are suspended in school. So really at this point, just expanding out from there and applying that uh, systemic racism lens to the St. Louis context. Thank you so much, Karishma. Karishma, if, um, Alex, if you don't mind going next. Sure. Um, I'm Alex Morshed. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for having me on the panel. This is very exciting. Um, I'm a postdoc at the Prevention Research Center at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, like Karishma, I also recently wrapped up my PhD. Um, and I, in terms of my hats, um, I'm predominantly a researcher. Um, I uh, focus on chronic disease prevention, most often around obesity and diabetes. And um, I do a whole lot of dissemination and implementation research, um, which um, pretty much means how do we put in place and keep in place things that work, things that we know that work, and also how do we take away things that don't. Um, I, um, I was one of the co-leads on the uh, Still Compromising series that Karishma mentioned and, and we'll talk about um, in a little bit, and how is my work shaped by the COVID pandemic? Well, there's certainly uh, certain things that are more difficult, um, but mostly uh, when thinking about that question, I was thinking, well, it just means that I'm pretty much adding on running a childcare in my home to my regular work. And so that was kind of front and center for me as I was answering that question. Um, so um, very happy to be here. Nice to see everybody. Thank you so much, Alex. And now Pam. Hi everyone, I'm Pamela Chan. I'm the Associate Director of the Social Policy Institute. Uh, we're a brand new institute at the university and our, um, our goal is to just be able to inspire policy changes around the world that give people equitable uh, social and economic opportunities. Um, so that means at the university we conduct research, um, we uh, help to foster policy dialogue, um, like the one here that the Fox Institute is being able 
to put together today, as well as to provide training in social policy uh, for students in the university community. Um, so I have, um, my formal training is in law, I have a, a legal background and um, in public administration, uh, but topically I've been uh, centered around community development and most recently moved to St. Louis from Washington, D.C., where I worked at an organization called Prosperity Now, uh, where we focused on building assets in low and moderate income communities, as well as closing the racial wealth gap. Um, and so I think um, most of my, my time there was spent uh, thinking about solutions to build up liquid assets um, amongst communities. That means emergency savings, as well as um, being able to um, look at solutions to address debt um, amongst households and so kind of knowing the precarity of um, the situation of families uh, just in just historically as well as in this in this current generation, um, it was really almost uh, nerve wracking just to kind of see the economic situation uh, take a turn because we had been so optimistic um, with the economic growth and it hadn't you know we knew we hadn't it hadn't reached um, all communities uh, that the benefits of that equally. Um, but now we're just really hoping that we can um, be able to support families and, and really be able to change policies uh, to be able to flip, flip the economy from where it's been before. So thank you so much uh, for putting together this conversation. It couldn't be more timely and important. Absolutely. Thank you so much, all of you. It's exciting to hear from you, um, to know that we have such a an outstanding group of individuals here to have this conversation with us. I would like to start with uh, Karishma and Alex. We, we made reference to a series you started called Still Compromising. And honestly, um, your first episode in Still Compromising really inspired me uh, personally to, to write about and think about what some people are calling the economic pandemic, right? And, and Pamela just alluded to um, she said precarious. So we, we had people who were already experiencing life in such a precarious state. And then COVID-19 came and just absolutely uh, showed us all the fault lines <laughs> in, in our current structures and, and the people who are honestly falling through those fault lines. I would love to direct this question to Karishma and Alex um, about, tell us a little bit about the series, which is a reference to the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Tell us what inspired that and um, just your motivation for creating it and what the data has been telling us. Yeah, sure. Um, so as you said, the, the title of the series is a reflection on where we are today, 200 years after the Missouri Compromise of 1820, um, in which Missouri was allowed into the Union as a slave state at, after insisting on the continued subjugation of human lives. And so um, more specifically, we wanted to reflect on that word compromising and how we are today still compromising on the value of human lives and um, how those lives tend to be the lives of black and brown people. So applying that lens, we wanted to apply that lens to uh, COVID and the disparate impact that we knew, like you can you feel it in your bones before you see it in the data, um, was going to have a disparate impact on people of color in our region. So we wanted to um, engage with that, to uh, use data to tell that story um, as the COVID pandemic sort of rippled out from its you know, um, viral sort of impact outwards to its um, epidemiological impact, to the social impact that it was having and the follow on crises that it was um, setting off economic, child care, educational, et cetera. So really contextualizing that in the St. Louis region, all at the end of the day to ask ourselves the question of how can we use this as a moment for, for change? Um, bound up in crisis is opportunity. And we, we didn't want to let that opportunity pass. I think lots of people recognize that. And so we wanted to put our heads together to talk about how um, we can use these moments uh, of ongoing crisis to change the system. Absolutely, that's inspiring because, um, you know, what uh, some of us who are locally uh, know Rebecca Bennett in the region, she was 
a panelist before. She was tied to the Ferguson Commission in different ways, and she's just a well-known civic leader in the St. Louis region. And she likes to say that, at least from, you know, what we take away from crisis is wisdom, right? Um, what emerges from crisis is wisdom. And so hopefully we'll have the wisdom to uh, make some real substantial changes. Alex, did you want to add anything about the process of the series? And because you've done about five or six episodes now, and, and the data is, is really painting a picture. Um, you know, it was pretty exciting. Um, this was Karishma's idea, and I was excited to join and represent the Prevention Research Center and our um, public health and um, data analysis expertise. Um, we focused on using local data. We really wanted to make the local data that are already available um, uh, and present them in a way that was actionable. And so hopefully we succeeded in that. It was, um, um, it was just a nice partnership be between a um, mostly academic center and a really great um, organization working at the community level and really making a difference. And in terms of, you know, as I'm thinking about my um, research career, like in terms of our time, how important it is to do this kind of service um, and to integrate that into your, you know, the time that you spend. Um, so just, I was excited to be part of it. And um, just full transparency, I had the opportunity to work with Allison Karishma on episode four, which I want to talk just quickly about episode four because it focuses really strongly on the financial health or lack of health of, of Black St. Louisans in particular. Um, what were some of the conditions that Black families were experiencing in St. Louis before COVID-19 and how has the pandemic intensified those conditions? Karishma, I'll, I'll take this one. I can start and you can fill in. Um, and Atia, you could probably speak to this more than we could, um, but thanks for uh, posing the question to us um, since you, you led that piece. Um, uh, so going into the pandemic, um, I would say the Black households were at a distinct disadvantage compared to um, white households. Um, in terms of several factors. So if we're thinking about wealth and if we're thinking about wealth as not something, um, you know, in terms of millions and millions of dollars, but something that really enables somebody to be protected from shocks, any kinds of like, if you have a health crisis and it turns into a financial crisis or if you lose your job, these are that household assets that really help somebody weather that kind of shock. And so in terms of um, what is coming in, in terms of building wealth and in terms of, of what is going out. So like what's coming in in terms of income, um, the quality of the job, um, some of these um, uh, wealth building strategies like home ownership or um, investments or retirement and um, what is going out like predatory practices um, um, to chip away at the wealt or um, fines and fees in the criminal justice system that kind of take away from somebody's ability to build um, these assets. Black households have been constantly, consistently um, facing a disadvantage, right? And so going into the COVID crisis, um, their vulnerability to the crisis is much greater than um, uh, white households. And so we, we, we can see this even at the local data in terms of the home ownership, which is two times higher in, um, among the white, uh, white families um, in terms of liquid, as liquid asset poverty. So for the white households, um, it's about one third and it's double that for the black households. Um, unemployment rate or uh, uninsured rate. So that is something that we were trying to show in the fourth episode. What are these differences? Um, how did we get there? These are based on historical actions um, uh, and policies. Um, these are not accidental. And what does it mean in terms of the, um, you know, I, I like to think about the speed of wealth building, right? Um, how can we catch up if the speed is so much higher for one group versus another group? Rishma, I'll let you say more. I think the only other thing that I would add, I think that was a, a really great uh, recap of that episode, um, is that we also talk about how uh, Black individuals were also 
on the on the fringes, on the margins, on the edge of uh, well-being and economic well-being being one version of that already. And so when a shock like this uh, occurs, they're that much more likely to fall over uh, that edge. So black individuals, black households are more likely to become unemployed. They're more likely to be furloughed. Um, and then on top of that, to be less able to withstand the economic ripple effects of um, losing those sources of income. So this very quickly snowballs into um, something much bigger than a moment in time uh, health pandemic for, for those individuals. Yeah, absolutely. And any of our panelists, you can weigh in on any time. Um, I, I want to be clear, but we, I did want to talk about that series. I mean, I, being able to write about that, I was amazed. I knew it antidotally. I could point to it in friends and family and growing up in St. Louis. You can see it. It's very tangible. I you know, being a product of the DSEG program, but I, you know, I wasn't from St. Louis originally moving here from the military and just understanding, um, you know, segregated segregation in St. Louis and and how that plays into your life outcomes, health and wealth wise. It was just amazing getting to work on this because it just like 20 years of my life came into focus. And I'm like, this is why I pursued social work probably, you know, wanting to understand um, the historic nature and, and the way policies by design can create these outcomes for human beings. I was amazed to look at household income, like black household income has remained nearly half of white household income in St. Louis since 2005. Um, the gap between home ownership, but then the value of that home ownership, who gets to pull out equity, equity and who doesn't, you know, um, I was amazed to look at figures like the, the debt burden, you know, the, 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 the education debt burden that's carried by black and brown people so much higher. Um, it just, to me, it just was amazing. It was so eye opening because I knew these things antidotally, right? And Pam is shaking her head because she's like, yeah, but then you look at trends in terms of places like St. Louis and then across the entire United States and you realize what Alex said. There's no way that this was accidental. Um, this is the cumulative effects and outcomes of more than 400 years of structural racism. So, you know, that it was just amazing though. So I want to jump back in and get our panelists back in on the conversation. Pamela, I think you want to add to that. I'm, I'm loving it. Like, just go for it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think you all just really are, are doing such a good job pointing out the consequences of the choices that have been made um, in our history. It's important to know that our economy was designed to be able to um, help those with resources to be able to continue to build from that while making it very difficult for those who um, don't have access to those kinds of resources to be able to thrive. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's probably a good moment to really be able to call out some of the discrete policy choices that have been made um, to create the situation that we're in. And, and for me and kind of my, my work, I really think about um, three key buckets of policies. And, I, and I've, I'm coming from the more national level, so I'll, I'll um, talk about that. And then I'm sure there are probably some things locally that uh, you all can speak to some more uh, but the first is related to jobs. I think it's important to just point out that we really have failed to make sure that we address the disparate, um, the disparate employment and wage adv advancements, particularly in the private sector. Um, you know, we don't really have strong requirements for employers to be able to address disparities amongst the workplace. Like, yes, we have um, for the public sector um, a lot more requirements um, in terms of um, addressing diversity and then also making sure that there's more fairness. And there was actually a reverse in trend in terms of um, that gap between um, black and white households in the US when we were able to see a growing public sector. Um, but since we've decided to divest from um, the public sector jobs, that particular dynamic has subsided um, in part because we haven't really done the same kind of uh, examination and kind of thought as to how do we get uh, private sector employers to be able to act as good actors creating good jobs the same way that the public sector um, was required to. I, mean, I think in terms of home ownership, you all pointed out how there's this huge home ownership gap. Um, and that was actually something that, um, you know, was in part driven by some of the federal government choices. Uh, in the 30s, the Federal Housing Administration, um, they chose to have practices where um, they refused to insure mortgages that were in or near black neighborhoods. 
Um, and they also chose to subsidize building um, in areas with restrictions um, that allowed for restrictions of sales of homes to black and to black households. So this was um, particularly aligned with the development of suburban um, America that was, that was coming out. And so both these dynamics kind of set up a, a situation where we see today um, there is less homeownership uh, amongst um, people in black communities and communities of colors as a legacy of these decisions that were made in, in the 1930s. Um, and in addition to that, layering on at the local level, there's also dynamics where um, assessments of homes in black communities um, are, are they're being overassessed for taxes and underappraised and therefore also leaching um, financial resources from, from black property owners. Um, and then the third, I think really important federal uh, policy to be able to examine here is the uh, GI Bill. So this was of course the bill coming out of World War II that was supposed to support um, soldiers coming back to the US uh, from the war to be able to help ensure that they had access to education, to be able to uh, gain housing and just be able to advance economically after their service to our country. Um, and that is one of the most amazing kind of policies that we've had as a country um, in terms of helping to build uh, wealth and assets um, amongst Americans. But the thing is, because of the way it was designed, it wasn't um, thought out intentionally to address equity. And so it was rolled out in a way where uh, the, the administration of it was done locally state by state. And so what that allowed was for states and localities to then be able to ensure that um, black soldiers, for example, were not able to get the same kinds of loans and financing benefits that white soldiers were, um, or be able to access the same kind of education. And so those benefits of the GI Bill didn't actually get to flow to households of colors the same way that um, it was for white households. And these are just three key policy areas that have kind of added up to the situation that we're in today. That was really eloquent. Tyrone, did you want to add to that or and, and, and talk about how that manifests currently in, in the population that you serve? So um, one of the things I think we often um, neglect is the this social construct that we have about race and culture and existence in and how that fits into all of this. And so what we see in the communities that we serve are uh, the ramifications from folks having conscious decisions uh, to create a subclass of people in our society that always bear the burden economically, um, on many levels socially, um, because if you want somebody to blame, you can definitely blame uh, a person of color and uh, oftentimes the St. Louis is somebody black, specifically black men. And so for us, um, you know, we work to try to reassemble, reconstitute the family around the principles and the pillars that we create a better family life, that we, we, we live by, by in better family life. Um, you know, I, I think if we don't really address um, the, the social challenge that we have, that being black is only now becoming okay to be in America. For the longest we've had to integrate, which was some of the disadvantage that we kind of were lured into, I won't say lured, but that, that developed out of uh, desegregation. And although I do believe that there is um, a necessity for us to work together in unity, Black people in the United States are the only people who do not have a collective identity that they can work from within. And so everyone else, everyone else, with the exception of Black folk, have that challenge. And so um, you don't see the same types of um, challenges that you see in other cultures because they always have this unity among themselves to say, well, at least if nothing else, we can pull together with each other. That alone leads to a lot of the challenges that you see uh, that we face economically, um, uh, from an educational perspective, uh, from a family perspective, as, as far as like having uh, two parent households, or at least active parents and two parent, two parent households. Uh, so those are all of those mitigating uh, underlying challenges that start with a social construct not just an economic uh, challenge. And, and it's interesting, the more I learn about the history, the social construct served an economic uh, end. So sure. if you think about the history of slavery and how it became racialized sure. and all the ways in which it was justified, it, but it really was an economic scheme. It was a way sure. to capitalize 
exploit yeah human life and sure. and i do think about this when you mentioned um to lure us in i think about my own family and and all the generations that we can go back in our, our story and i think about how there was a promise of assimilation right there was an idea of give up all your identity as african african american black assimilate and the formula of the american dream will work for you that was the promise yeah. right that's one of the biggest fallacies ever and it's very prominent in my generation and my children's generation, when I look at the fallacy that my, my grandparents dutifully followed, work hard, get an education, buy a home, and all the years later where I can look at and say, didn't pay off, didn't pay, like not the way we, not the way it was promised. So the promise of a simulation, the promise of just, just follow the formula, it's one of the biggest fallacies ever. And when I think about the lack of return of investment on home ownership, when I think about the burden, the overburden of student loan debt, and when I think about the fact that there are still racial and gender wage gaps, um, and, 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 and Pamela so eloquently outlined three major US policies, uh, really buckets of policies that, cre that by design said, you know, no matter what you do, you're gonna be excluded from wealth. <laughs> right. And of course, when you look at the fact that, you know, white households have 10 times the wealth of the average black household, and I, you know, I'm gonna. I'm just curious what it's gonna look like in a year or two post pandemic. Um, I I imagine the gap will even be greater than we can well, imagine. Well, I, I know in our work, that's what I'm most most concerned about. And and for years, the issue has been isolated to our communities. And so now, as again a function of culture, now the culture that used to be just um, something that was on the shelf on a rap album or something as a fashion from Fubu or whatever the latest latest fashion craze is. Now the fashion is dysfunction. And so in many of the communities that we serve, dysfunction is a fashionable item. And we have to work on that as a social construct to affect economics, which we know initially it, it was created. I had the, the, this, the challenge of, of, of real estate and home ownership, you know, if it was not for the fact that I run a housing program and I worked in real estate for a number of years to understand how to properly even challenge uh, some, of the, some of the issues, um, I had to literally fight with an appraiser. Like I was hung up on by appraiser because I asked, why did you make this adjustment? Because it doesn't make sense against the comparable that you're using to base my value of my home. And I literally was hung up on it because he knew where the home was. He probably knew who I was uh, just from speaking to me. And um, it, it presented a challenge. And I, and I paid probably more taxes than some folks even in Ladue. And that's, that's, that's amazing to me. Um, I want to ask a question about assets because I think I heard Alex mention liquid assets. I heard Pamela and I heard Tyrone. All of you work in assets. I learned a lot about the role of assets in in building wealth and security. I want you all to just elaborate a little bit, elaborate <laughs> a little bit more about the role of assets uh, and some of the programs now and policies that are looking at asset building. So I guess I'll go. Um, so, you know, th there's, a, there's a couple of things along with, to go with, with assets, of course. And for us, home ownership and, and creating enterprise through, through a business is one of the, the best ways, I think, to control your own financial narrative. And we work to do that at Better Family Life. Um, but having a, a better education about what to do with those assets and making sure families know how to leverage them going forward um, and for me, time and time again, that has been kind of the linchpin is understanding how to leverage those assets to push it forward and not just to exist in the moment and be happy with the idea that I've reached this social construct of having, uh, you know, my, my white picket fence and my two kids, the wife and the dog. And, you know, so I, we have to move past just that moment in time if we are able to achieve it, but learning how to leverage it for future generations so that they can create like a, a can use it as a true asset, which is an asset is something that returns money to you, not take money away from you. Thank you. I think that that's absolutely right. I mean, I think oftentimes I hear um, wealth framed as as power. That having having wealth is is power, and you know, I think there is. There is a lot that can be done on an individual level to just be able to build wealth um, within households. 
Um, I think something that is key is, is improving job quality. I mean, income is not everything, um, and it, it, income is important in terms of being able to make ends meet, make a day-to-day. -day. Assets help in terms of ensuring stability over the longer term, as well as across generations. Um, but, you know, they, they go together. Asset accumulation is kind of um, everything in someone's financial life just working out um, in a way that they can be able to accumulate um, wealth. And so um, in terms of at an individual level, things that can help just people in households be able to build wealth, um, improving the access and, and ability to, to grow in quality jobs is, is really important. Um, and that's uh, something that in terms of at the Social Policy Institute, we've been uh, thinking a lot about through our Workforce Financial Stability Initiative is um, we understand, we have a pretty good understanding as to what are the helpful qualities of a job that can um, help a family stabilize as well as to advance economically. Um, but we can't quite figure out uh, what are the ways to get the employers um, to be able to act and move in a way to be able to provide those jobs and make sure that those, that they're um, hiring more equitably and making sure that these good jobs are being accessed more equitably. And so um, we're, we're trying to think about, like, we're trying to explore, you know, what's the decision criteria that employers are putting into making decisions about the kinds of jobs they offer, the benefits that they offer, um, the pay and scheduling structure that they have so that we can think about how do you create the policy world um, to be able to nudge uh, employers towards offering better jobs. Um, the other thing we think a lot about is just ways to be able to help build uh, savings more directly, uh, whether that's uh, leveraging moments like the tax time, which oftentimes is the largest cash infusion for individual households, um, being able to have easier ways to put some of that aside um, for savings when they, when they can. Uh, we know that that money is also slated for, for many other financial purchases, such as, you know, maybe being able to pay for uh, an appliance or, you know, a refrigerator or maybe a car or something or being able to pay back some debts. But it's also an important moment to be able to help um, build up savings and just be able to provide access to um, more savings products and services that are tailored to the needs of folks who are in more constrained financial situations. Um, so those are just some things that, you know, policy can be able to help change um, the, the lives more immediately of people on the ground. Um, but I think there's also a whole host of things that can be done to change the systems that we have, because that's important too. It's like the, the, um, the people on their own can only, only build so much when, when there's an entire economy that is built um, against uh, individuals being able to be able to thrive and build wealth um, as, as individual households. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, oftentimes we want to put the onus and the responsibility back on the individual and individual family. And I'm, I'm all, I support any type of structure that helps to catalyze those behaviors for individual families. And I've seen it where, you know, that only goes so far until we, you know, we can't meet the match. Uh, the only way we match just how insidious <laughs> structural racism uh, has created such disparities in, in health and economics is to match it with um, the fervor which with it was created. I want to ask Alex and Karishma and really anybody else about sort of the really um, other local initiatives or policies or movements to help us address some of the more structural systemic um, barriers to uh, economic um, and wealth building for families of color. Yeah, I think um Today on the ballot is Medicaid expansion. I hope everyone has gotten out to, to vote or has sent their ballots in by mail and through that whole process. So um, tremendous amount of organizing has gone into uh, putting that out uh, for vote. And that is, as the social determinants of health framework tells us, our health is bound up in all of these other system systems of transportation and housing and jobs, et cetera. So, um, if your health is is impacted, you can't thrive in any other way in, in your life. So um, that organizing is a powerful uh, batch of organizing to be a part of. There's work around raising the minimum wage in St. Louis, um, undeniably important for people to be able to, to put in a, a full work week and make ends meet, um, given the economic realities of 
buying a house and paying for groceries and everything. Um, there's also some great organizing going on through the Ready by Five uh, Coalition to transform our early childhood education landscape in this region. I think more so than ever before right now, we're realizing how um, essential childcare is and how deeply broken our childcare system is, which I think we, we all know at some level, especially when we hear about what it's like in other countries and contrast that with the realities and the expense of childcare and how uh, that drastically limits the opportunities for other, other, otherwise um, working adults who have to choose between taking care of their kids or, um, or getting a job because the economics don't um, bear out being able to do uh, both. So those are, those are three that off, off the top of uh, my head that I would encourage people to plug into if they're here in the St. Louis area or to look for similar um, initiatives wherever in the country they are. Absolutely, thank you, Karishma. Uh, Tyrone, would you like to add to that? You, you know, Atia, you, you, you alluded to something uh, just before uh, Karishma started speaking that, um, you know, we, we really have to focus on building uh, capacity from a family level for people. Um, and I think that's some of what we're addressing, but also the capacity of other, in St. Louis or from my perspective, black organizations specifically. So black, when I say black organizations, black from a board perspective, a, a CEO or a director's perspective, from, from the folks on the ground. And, and I'm not saying to the exclusivity for that, but I'm saying if we wanna see the real conditions of a community change, just the fervor of creating racism and creating these systems, these, these social systems that have manipulated economic, I mean, economic policy have manipulated social systems. We have, to, we have to go in the other direction to start to see the needle move. And unfortunately it requires us to share and give. And so people have to be ready to give financially. So one of my, one of my uh, challenges to folks, if you really wanna see black wealth rise, find a black business and stop talking about it. Give them money for their product or service. Mm -hmm. Invest in a black business. If you want to see blackness get to a level where we have some some wealth created, if you want to see something that is can be just as effective as voting, empower people to be able to be united and be okay with their blackness in order uh, to to make some economic changes. And and that's not anything that takes away from anybody else's culture, but we know specifically in America, especially in St. Louis, that's been the challenge is in black Americans. How do we how do we shift economics in a way where we're putting real investment in the same communities that we took investment from and that we disallowed investment to, to, to take place in by limiting uh, real estate values, by limiting the, the capacity of schools and, and uh, preschools, uh, especially daycares. Those are the things that we over invest in. I won't call it over. If we truly invest in, we can start to see those returns happen a lot quicker than what I think a lot of people uh, may may, uh, may think to be the case. I think that's a, a great point. And I just um, echo that at, at Forward Through Ferguson, we like to say that diagnosis determines treatment. And when you look at the world and you say, and, and you're, you're, you've got this um, very ingrained narrative of individual responsibility and shortcomings and weakness as the driver of the disparities and outcomes that we see, um, that leads to certain types of interventions that, that we see lots of around us, band-aids, programs, you know, backpacks for kids in schools and, and, and the like. Um, and so if, if you want to change the intervention, we really need to increase our capacity to understand and differently diagnose the issues. So we need to increase awareness of uh, what the, the idea of systemic racism is. We need a um, deepen understanding before we can hope to achieve transformation. And so I, I think absolutely want to echo what Tyrone said around just increasing capacity around um, awareness, understanding of, of um, racial equity and racial inequity and systemic racism. And I, I, I can see reasons for hope in that in our landscape when we look at our ability to have these conversations now relative to five, uh, 10 years ago. Um, but I still think there's a lot of work uh, to do and that needs to happen before we can hope to like really um, implement the types of policies that need to be implemented because otherwise we end up playing this vicious game of whack-a-mole because we haven't really isolated 
um, the problem. And that's at best. At, at worst is that you're operating again off the basis of um, some deeply toxic and, and, and broken narratives that are deeply inculcated in our culture. Absolutely. I want to bring to light something else Tyrone said. He was like, you know, when we think about, someone asked about um, foundations and philanthropy, when we think about giving, I want to challenge you of what we gain when we do the right thing. So this isn't about giving in a charitable sense at all, but supporting um, Black-led organizations, supporting the Black dollar, supporting the prosperity of Black families. First of all, it's righting a wrong if you consider all this, is, this is the ways history and um, policies literally fought against <laughs> and excluded Black and Brown people from wealth building. But I also want to say our entire economic structure, our entire region, our entire nation gains from this. So the cost of racial inequity is high. We have multiple reports in this region and in the entire nation that have tried to quantify just how detrimental and how costly racism and racial inequity has been when we consider the lifetime outcomes from everything from education and, and wage disparity to health disparities and the cost of that to the over-incarceration of black and brown people. The cost is too heavy for us to bear anymore as an entire nation. So it is not about giving anything, but it's what we stand to all gain by righting these wrongs, honestly. And then some of, something else, Karishma, I want to, I just want to attach to what Karishma was saying. Um, just at this point, just about any policy that redresses racial inequity or that addresses it and advances it actually has some type of economic um, benefit attached to it. So uh, if we think about the work she's doing with um, the disciplinary action for young people in schools and creating that prison, uh, that school to prison pipeline and who benefits from that and who doesn't. And once you understand that and you realize it's all in our interest, it's all in our interest to work to, to uproot and dismantle these racist policies that create these outcomes, we all bear the burden of racism, every single person, some more than others as we can see. Um, and so I wanna, someone said something just now about maybe leveraging this current movement, right? So we are in this like sort of incredible, I feel like a tidal wave of like awakening, right? Across the nation. It took another black man to die at the hands of police to somehow trigger this, a different response. Um, you know, this years and in, in decades and centuries overdue, but we are in a moment where we are having this mass awakening uh, or understanding and so I am curious to ask the panelists, we're, we're maybe in an energizing and a hopeful moment, right? Karishma outlined at least three local um, strategies, policy strategies to address um, equity. I want to just ask everybody, how do we leverage this moment for racial justice to advance economic and racial equality? And, and you know, tell me something hopeful. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll start. I don't have like the answer by any means, but um, I think what I find myself leaning towards is really a leaning into uh, the discomfort and uh, growing, like, educating ourselves, basically, especially um, for those of us who aren't amongst the like most deeply affected of populations and who are watching this um, crisis, these crises uh, unfold from a position of privilege as, as not the target of systemic racism in our country and all the ways it, it um, rolls out in all of our institutions. Um, so I think the, the call for us right now is to educate ourselves and, and not by like asking our, our black friends to explain everything for us, but that there are tremendous resources out there. There's so much to read, there's so much to listen to, there's so much to watch. Um, and it, takes wherewithal, it takes resources, you have to commit your time to it. Um, but I think the only way we get to that ability to diagnose and, and define a, an intervention, a treatment, is by like being um, firm in, in our, our knowledge and, and having that um, commitment to learning and commitment to being uncomfortable um, and to 
to that commitment to questioning sort of the air we breathe and the systems that we have operated in day in and day out uh, for our whole lives and that probably have been engineered to benefit us at the cost of others um, and yeah being willing to engage with all of that so i'd say um, the the moment right now is is for us to get educated so that we can then take action um, it, it can't it has to be in that order um, in, in, in my mind because otherwise like i said you get this vicious cycle of, of, of things I saw Alex. Did, did you want to say something? Otherwise, I can jump in. You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we just actually at the Social Policy Institute just had a, an event back in June uh, where we looked at the impacts of COVID-19 on wealth. And I just want to lift up to some of the asks um, that were asked that our panelists uh, put out. And, and I think the person who really synthesized this the best was Dr. Derek Hamilton. He is a professor. He was at The Ohio State. He is now going to be at the New School. He's an economist that focuses on, um, on, on wealth gap issues. And um, he called for an economic bill of rights, which included asking for federal jobs guarantee, Medicare for all, uh, banking reform and financial services, um, and debt forgiveness, particularly in the area of, of student loans. And so I think I really appreciate that, that framing and framework from someone who is, uh, you know, spent his, his life working very passionately on these issues and, and just wanna, wanna be able to lift that up. And if you all wanna um, actually see him as well as Dr. Fenneba Adlo, as well as um, Anna, Anna Hernandez-Kent, um, talk about uh, these policy recommendations in particular. Um, you can see that they, Etia just put up a link to uh, the event itself. I think locally, um, two things that I'm kind of excited to learn more about um, is starting in the fall, um, the Social Policy Institute, we're going to be hosting um, a series of events that is currently under development. So you guys are getting a little bit of a secret preview here. It's not public yet. Um, around inclusive growth in St. Louis. And I'm hoping, um, like I said, this is still a policy series in development, um, but I'm hoping we'll get to talk about some of the kind of community investment um, opportunities that, um, that I've, I've already been learning about and have been seeing here, such as um, one is, uh, one is the, the kind of restructuring of the way opportunity zones are presented. So opportunity zones are, um, kind of a federal program to help be able to build up um, neighborhoods. But the problem of Opportunity Zone so, so far is that it has actually led to disinvestment amongst um, people who are from those communities, from black community members and brown community members, um, and benefiting um, those who are coming into the neighborhoods. And so I think that it seems like in St. Louis, there might be some efforts to be able to change that balance a little bit more, making sure that the benefits of a program like Opportunity um, zones uh, flows uh, to the people who are, are from that community or who are business owners of that community. Um, so I'd be interested in being able to learn more about that and engage in a dialogue around that. Um, and the other thing that I've started learning about is related to housing and it's um, based off of a model. Um, I, I heard about it first in Detroit called the Green Lining Initiative or the Green Lining Fund. And the idea here is to be able to um, address the kind of home ownership, particularly the over assessment for taxation and um, under appraisal of household of houses um, and, and black neighborhoods and being able to reverse that redlining by creating a fund that then uh, be able, is able to help bridge that, that gap that currently exists um, that prevents these neighborhoods from being fairly valued the way it should be. Um, so I'm not the expert on any of these, um, for sure, but those are just two things that I've been learning about here that I think is um, very interesting. I was just um, going to comment on this question because it's, a, you know, it's, it's certainly an opportunity, you know, with this movement and um, in terms of my work, which is mostly research, um, We've, we've been having a lot of conversations at the Prevention Research Center, for example, and so this, I'm thinking about internal work, internal organizational and personal work that is happening. Um, we've been applying the equity lens to our work, and now we're explicitly trying to um, develop some structures to continuously and consistently apply the racial justice lens to our work. And so as part of those conversations, it, it's... Um, caused me to reflect on how I do my research, uh, how I engage with partners, um, and 
I would say um, my kind of call to researchers would be just to engage with equity and specifically racial justice at some level because there really is a continuum of actions that one can take and public health has been growing in this area and you know so even from generating um, research and evidence that touches um, people who are at the greatest need um, for this evidence who have not been represented in research, um, making sure that as we are gen generating this evidence, certainly, but also as we're implementing things that we think work, uh, one, we are doing it in partnership with uh, communities whom it affects, um, uh, that, um, uh, uh, that if the evidence has not, you know, uh, been generated from groups that we are trying to implement and we better make sure that the adaptation process is there. And here I'm talking more and pulling from the work by uh, Bauman and Cabasa from the Brown School um, in, uh, in terms of applying the equity lens to dissemination and implementation science. Um, and challenging some of these um, um, funding structures that shape our work and that in terms of obesity the second episode of our series had to do with who is at greatest greatest risk for covid and negative health consequences of covid just based on health factors and we have this conversation a lot in obesity you know it's so much focus in our national discourse on what the individual responsibility is whereas we know that the behavior is shaped by our environments and by um, social, physical environments that we are exposed to, and those are in turn shaped by those who have stakes in um, our behaviors looking a certain way, us consuming a certain type of product. Um, and so it, in terms of generating evidence and then using, hopefully, um, that evidence to um, inform policies, because policies are not always informed by evidence, but in this idealist proce idealized process, we need to kind of push our funders, and there are some funders that are better than others, to let us look at these truly transformative actions, you know, not just compensating for what is for what is in our community and trying to study what works in obesity, not just compensating for the economic disadvantage, but being able to integrate um, actions to transform the economic disadvantage as part of my obesity work. And even if, it, if the, um, the time horizon is much longer, if we can figure out a way to show progress um, uh, with a longer vision than just, you know, a couple of years, do both and um, so. Can I real quick just affirm what I heard, at, especially at the beginning of that, that um, so often when we think about systems and policy change, we think about big P policy and we forget about little P policy and the fact that systems at the end of the day are made up of people and individuals comprise organizations, comprise institutions, and all of those things roll up into systems. So uh, we are the system. We each have a sphere of influence, and it's incumbent upon all of us to figure out how we uh, use our levers to uh, to correct these these wrongs and how all of that collectively then shifts a system. And that it's not the job just of policymakers over there or the people in D.C. or Jeff City um, that we really have a, a role to play in all of this. Yeah, none of these systems are going to shift and change without real actors and players. And so as much as we blame the entire system, it's fallible not to hold people accountable. We are actors. Policymakers are actors. Researchers, funders, we're all actors in this. Now you better figure out what, uh, you know, <laughs> what's going to be your line come this next, uh, this next act. Tyrone, did you want to, I know that some people have to leave. They have commitments starting at 1.30. If a couple of, if you can hang on for a couple of minutes, we'll wrap it up really soon here. Thank you so much to this audience. But Tyrone, I want to give you a chance to. You know, the, the, the thing that I see that bothers me the most, because, you know, literally our offices are in some of the, probably one of the more challenged neighborhoods that, I, that, we, that we are actually operating in. And it's just this lack of hope, you know, and, and I think we're in a space and time where, we can truly rebuild hope in individuals. Um, you know, I know it is important to have systems, but um, I want to, I guess, maybe leave you all with a thought. My grandmother was born in 1912. Um, she passed about 20 or so years ago, and uh, but she was an amazing woman. She managed to accumulate over her lifetime 
um, with an eighth grade education, a single parent. Her husband died when my mom was two. So I don't even, I never met my grandfather. She didn't even remember who he was. And in her lifetime, she managed to accumulate um, about 24000 in cash and a savings account, which today's dollars is about, I think it was like 62000 or so. And I don't know many people right now who, when they retire, have 60 something thousand dollars uh, in the bank. So, but there was a hope in her that somehow this generation we've allowed um, to not translate. And some of that is us. And we have to we have to take ownership in that and be okay with who we are. And I think this conversation about race should not be divisive. Um, it shouldn't have to be. It should not be a winner and a loser. That's that's a social construct that our our economy has put together that you have to lose in order for me to win. And that's not the case at all. I think my blackness should only highlight anybody's whiteness or Bosnianness or from whatever part of the world that you're from. It should not have to be to the exclusion. And I think we've operated on this, this real um, exclusive, limited, um, scarce, uh, scarcity mentality as a nation when we in fact have everything and every resource at our fingertips to do whatever we need to do. And we're in a space now where that conversation needs to take place and we have to take ownership and say, hey, look, I see injustice or I see um, poverty even on any level and engage. You have the power to right now through your own contacts, your own social circles to engage to affect, to affect change. And there are too many organizations that are at, that is, there are, I don't know how many thousands of, of nonprofits just in St. Louis. There's no reason to create another nonprofit. We don't even need to have another conversation. We just need to act in faith and engage on a consistent basis, basis so people know that there is hope in, even in being poor. My grandmother was poor. She worked as a CNA. So there should not have to be some major social uh, economic policy implementation to get people to have hope. And that's really what we need to re-implement and reinstitute in these communities is some sense of hope that comes not only from outside, but from within. Thank you so much for wrapping it up with the sense of hope. We should feel energized. I think there's a real mo uh, opportunity to catalyze this current um, fervor around racial justice and healing, and that everyone has a place in this, everyone has a place here to do this work, to be part of it, um, especially the almost 100 people that join us today. I just want to say thank you to them for listening. I hope you take away one thing. Uh, we highlighted so many different things today. It's a lot. If you get a chance, watch the recording, share it with a friend. These are the messages we want people to hear that, um, yes, we are sitting on 200, 400, uh, 1400 years <laughs> uh, in the making of, of systems that have created uh, the lives that we live now, the experiences that we have now but that we have the strength, the capacity, the innovation, and all of the resources available to us to change that. And so we hope that you will be part of that change. We hope that you will continue to stay tuned to these conversations. We do have two more in this series, and then we will be launching a new series. Thank you so much to our panelists who have been just incredible today. I could talk to you all for another hour, but I won't. <laughs> so thank you all. We really appreciate everything you've done and said today. Peace. Keep doing it.